This is my full living decks in Pokemon Home. Every Pokemon, including form changes, gender differences, and regional variants, with maybe one or two missing. I started this living decks years ago back in my Fire Red copy. I would catch every Pokemon I could and send them up to the latest games while catching every new Pokemon the newer games had to offer. I would also try to catch every Pokemon as far back as possible in order to obtain later evolutions or regional variants. For example, if I wanted a Galarian Weezing, I would first catch a Coughing in my Fire red copy, send it all the way up into Sword and Shield, and then evolve it there. But what if I took this a step further? My name is Dominator, and in this series I will be revamping my entire living decks in Pokemon Home by catching every Pokemon in their original games, and I will be doing this using Pokeballs only. In the last episode, I caught every Generation 1 Pokemon in their original games along with some extras to use for later evolutions as you will see later in this video. I'd highly recommend watching that episode before this one. One thing I want to explain before we start this episode is that I did catch every Generation 1 Pokemon that I needed to in order to evolve into later Gen Pokemon, but I will not be doing that moving forward with this series. There are two reasons for this. The first being that I think it'd be more interesting to revisit a past generation in order to catch a future generation Pokemon when we need to as opposed to just simply having them all from the start and just evolving them, like what I will be doing in this video. The second reason is that I really just couldn't bring myself to catch around 100 Generation 2 Dunsparce just to check to see if I'll get a 3 segment to Dunsparce 7 generations from now. I will be using the Generation 1 Pokemon that I caught in the last video for the rest of the series though, so if you're confused as to why I already have some later gen evolutions but not others, this is why. In the last video, I explained that in the Generation 1 and 2 games, Pokeball data isn't saved, so you can theoretically catch every Pokemon with Master Balls or Ultra Balls or whatever Pokeball you want, and when you send them up into Pokemon Bank or later, they will all say that they were caught in Pokeballs regardless. Now, I did explain this about halfway through the last video, but I guess a lot of people didn't watch the video that far, and I got a lot of comments telling me that, even though I did already explain it in the video, so I guess I'm just gonna throw this fact in at the beginning of the video. So rest assured, I am aware that even though I want to be using Pokeballs only, I technically don't have to, but I will be doing it for the challenge aspect anyway. I believe that's all I need to cover for now, so before we begin, if you made it this far, please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. I still have 7 more generations to do this with, and if you do those two things, it will let me know that you're enjoying the series. Alright, let's begin. One little update I wanted to get out of the way for my living decks was Jinx and Mr. Mime. In Generation 1, you can only get these two Pokemon from NPC trades, but I wanted to have them with my original trainer name and ID. Thanks to you guys in the comments, you suggested that I simply catch Mr. Mime and Jinx in Generation 2, then trade them back to Generation 1 and send them up into Bank from there. That way I can have them with my original trainer name and ID, and the games still count the Pokemon as being caught in Kanto in the Generation 1 games. So we got ourselves a Jinx in Ice Path and a Mr. Mime in the route below Pallet Town. Full disclosure is I don't know every route name by heart, so bear in mind, I will just use directions to describe what route I'm catching some Pokemon on. So we got those two Pokemon and sent them over to my blue copy before sending them up into Pokemon Bank and then later Pokemon Home. But I realized something interesting with Mr. Mime. Grab Mr. Mime. Oh, these guys are in all caps? Wait, why is Mr. Mime in all caps? Why is Mr. Mime in all caps? But Jinx is, is normal. I caught them on the same game. Both caught wild. <laughs> what? I'm curious if I can change the uh, the name on this to a lowercase. There's no space. Why isn't there a space? <laughs> what? That's so bizarre. It might not let me change the name because of the fact that it's not a standard Mr. Mime name. I think I think for me for it to allow me to change the name, it would have to be this Mr. Mime. Yep, I cannot change it. <laughs> I don't know why it did that. Maybe off stream I check to see if another one will be different. Cause that's either that or I just nickname it with like lower cases and proper spacing. <laughs> but I'll do that off stream. I don't want to do that again. That was annoying having to catch that one. So yeah, unfortunately, I have to re-catch Mr. Mime and actually name it Mr. Mime with proper capitals and spacing because for some reason, I think the period or the space in the name glitched it out when sending up. So uh, it's, it's just 
got all caps and no space in its name so we got to do that later but for now i wanted to start catching some more gen 2 pokemon so we started with some headbutt trees we got ourselves a couple hoot hoot and four ledybuzz the reason why i need four lediba is because both lediba and ledian have a gender difference so we got to get both of those luckily this generation you can actually see the genders so all i just had to keep encountering them until they were their correct genders this time which made it way easier i also want to point out that we have a little counter and a face cam on on screen now this is because i streamed about half of this challenge on my twitch channel before my camera started glitching out a bunch so yeah if you want to see me continue the series live you can follow me on twitch i will have my channel linked in the description we also do a bunch of crazy shiny hunting challenges and just shiny hunting in general so i'd highly recommend you check that out also if you did notice we started with our counter at like number 13 that's because of the evolutions we had previously caught in generation one after catching the letty buds we then accidentally ran into a centret which obviously we did need so we easily caught that one. Then we continued going to a different area to headbutt trees for a few more Pokemon. So we continued going for some headbutt Pokemon. In this case, we got Spinarak and Pineco. While we're catching this Pineco, let me explain that Pineco is one of the few Pokemon that is on rare headbutt trees only. There's a little calculator that I use that lets you know what headbutt trees you have that will give you the rare Pokemon. And I'll leave that linked in the description of this video if you want to check that out and find your headbutt tree Pokemon. After catching the two Pineco, for the evolution line we needed to get two heracross which the reason why we need two heracross is because heracross has a gender difference so we caught two of those pretty easily and then we needed to catch ourselves two apom now apom you technically need four of them for ambipom and the gender differences because the full line has gender differences but we're only going to be catching the two for this video. We'll come back and catch two more for Ambipom later. And next up, and I probably should explain this because I kind of did the same thing last video that I'm doing this video, is that we're kind of all over the place doing this. We kind of just go for what we want, what we can do, what we have access for, and what we're just nearby at the time. So certain things will be pretty back and forth, but I am doing them in the rough order that I actually caught these Pokemon in, so keep that in mind. But we are fishing for a Corsola. Corsola is 10% in the area we were at, and we ended up getting it first try, which was pretty cool. Then we needed to catch ourselves a couple Chinchow, which for some reason, these ones took us way longer to find, and I think they were like 30%, so that was kind of ridiculous. After the Chinchow, we went to Cyanwood City and used Rock Smash on some of the rocks to find ourselves a Shuckle, which we got first try as well, which is also 10%, and you're not even guaranteed to get an encounter from the Rock Smash, which is pretty cool. After catching the Shuckle, we got a call from Bill to let us know that a PC box was filled up which is actually really convenient for these games as you can only send Pokemon up through Pokemon Bank from box one and it's really inconvenient to move Pokemon around in the boxes as you have to take them out into your party and then change boxes which takes kind of a long time and then deposit them back in the new box so every time Bill called us letting us know that box one was filled up that was our cue to send a wave of Pokemon into Pokemon Bank so here are the first 20 Pokemon we are sending up after that we needed to locate Natu and Smeargle which you get in like the back side of the room ruins of Alf. So while we were traversing through that, we ended up finding an unknown S. We need to get 25 more of these letters in these games. So we'll get back to those later. But as we were trekking through the place, we found ourselves a random hopip, which we did need. We didn't complete the line, but we will continue with the rest later on in the video. Then we made it to the patch of grass we needed to for Natu. We needed to catch three Natu as Zatu has a gender difference and Natu does not. So we need three of them total. And in the same patch of grass with a lower encounter rate, we found ourselves a Smeargle. This is not a shiny Smeargle. Smeargle just looks like that in Generation 2 for some reason. Keep that in mind. It's not a shiny Smeargle. I know it would be cool if we found one, but maybe maybe sometime during the series we'll actually find a random shiny. That'd be pretty cool. We then found one of the puzzles of the Ruins of Alf, this one being Ho-Oh, which honestly we kept swapping it around and it wasn't working sometimes than it was. It was very confusing because some of them looked like they were actually complete when they weren't. Every time you complete one of these puzzles, it gives you access to more unknown letters. So what we were trying to do was catch as many as possible with what we currently had. And then just once we had pretty much all of those letters, then unlock more as the less letters you have, the more likely you are to get the ones you're going for. Then when we needed more of the letters, we would complete another puzzle and get more of those letters. So here we're catching unknown T, unknown U, V, Y, Z, W, and X. Next, while still at the Ruins of Alf, we decided to surf because we can get both Wooper and Quagsire here. We need to catch two of each as Wooper and Quagsire both have gender differences. 
Whoopers is pretty obvious, but Quagsire's, you can only really see it from the back in later gens. It's just like its back fin is a little taller when it's a male, so it's pretty subtle, but we still gotta go for all the gender differences. Next up, we had to solve another Ruins of Alf puzzle to get more unknown letters, which this one was Kabuto. Again, it looks like it's complete half the time, but just a couple are still swapped around even though they look exactly the same. So it was a bit confusing there, but we figured it out. And we had access to more letters. This time we catch unknown I, unknown B, unknown F. And after catching unknown F, Bill called us again to let us know our box was full. So we had to send another wave up into Pokemon Home. Again, this was actually a really convenient feature as in generation one, it didn't tell you when a box was full. And if you had a full box that you were currently set to, it just wouldn't let you chuck Pokeballs at a Pokemon. We had to learn that the hard way a few times. After sending those Pokemon into Pokemon, on bank. We then went for some more unknown. We got unknown D, unknown C, unknown K, unknown A, unknown G, unknown J, and unknown E. We still had access to unknown H, but it was taking me way too long to find it, so I figured we'd probably end up finding it anyway after we had more unknown unlocked. So we went back and solved another Ruins of Elf puzzle, this time being Ammonite. This one also really threw me off because Ammonite for some reason only has one eye in that picture. I don't know why. It's a very weird perspective thing. But then we had access to more unknowns. So now we found unknown R, unknown H, which is the one we needed from before, but luckily we ended up finding it right away this time. Unknown Q, unknown P, unknown L, unknown N, unknown O, and unknown M. And if I'm not mistaken, that should be all the unknown. Now you may be wondering, what about unknown exclamation point and question mark? Well, actually those unknown didn't get introduced until generation three. So we'll be catching those in a different game. Next up, we flew to Goldenrod City and because I beat the Elite Four and we are on the Crystal Virtual Console, it automatically activated a special event with the GS ball in order for us to get Celebi. At the end of the last video, we kind of finished off with Mew getting that as the last Pokemon. This one, we didn't really want to wait till the end because we had access to it already and we still had to wait a day just to get the event to start. So we gave the GS ball to Kurt and he tells us he needs to examine it for a day. You can cheese this and change your clock, but I figured I'd be catching Pokemon for a few days later. So we'd end up getting it without having to change our time anyway. Then we went to Mount Mortar and just surfed in the water to get a couple Mary. Meryl. We only need two of those as Meryl doesn't have a gender difference and we'll get Azrael in generation three. We then went back to locate the rest of the Hoppip line and shortly after that this happened. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> uh, sleep powder! Pokeball! <laughs> Can you imagine I catch this thing? Oh my gosh, I thought it was gonna get caught. <laughs> I shouldn't have used that Pokeball, but we'll risk this. As soon as this thing wakes up, it's running. Try to at least weaken this a bit so for next time. Honestly, what would be the strat would be if I ran from it because then it wouldn't wake up and then it would stay asleep. It's a 5% chance. What happens if I make it 25? It, it barely changed. Whatever. If we find it, if, if we find it again, we have it at half HP. We find it again, we'll just put it to sleep again. I can't believe the first one shook three times. Wait, it's not, it's not running. Is it, it's just a random chance it runs. It's probably very high. There it is, okay. All right, well, if we find it again, we will uh, just put it back to sleep and chuck balls at it. And that's just, that's just gonna be what we do. Then I wanted to fix the issue with what we had with Mr. Mime, so I went back to Kanto and ended up accidentally finding a Furret. Now, I did catch two Sentrets for this video already, but I figured why evolve another Pokemon if I don't have to, so we just caught the Furret to account for our living decks instead of the two Sentret. Then Bill called us again, told us our storage was full, and we had to send more Pokemon into Bank. We then located another Mr. Mime, caught it, we nicknamed it properly with proper capitals and spaces. But unfortunately, I messed up on this one as well, and actually, sent it up to Pokemon Bank before sending it back into Generation 1, so it said it was from Johto, so yeah, even though we did this almost completely correct, we have to do it again. But I didn't realize this until much later, so we went to the National Park, and I caught myself a couple Sunkern, 
Now I'm gonna play this second Sunkern catch because I just wanna show off how awful it is to catch Pokemon in this game. Let me break it down to you. There's a resource you can use online called the Cave of Dragonflies and they have catch rate calculators for every generation of Pokemon as the mechanics work slightly different across each game. And for generation two, if you have a Sunkern that is at full HP and asleep, it should be roughly a 33, 34% chance to get caught per Pokeball. And yeah, this one took us, I think, six Pokeballs to catch. Now that's very plausible as I could have just gotten unlucky with it and it took six balls to catch, which is just double odds. But the thing I want to point out is that this happened for way more Pokemon than you would think it would. So it's just way harder to catch Pokemon in this game than most other Pokemon games. And that was kind of the main challenge with this generation. It's going to be really nice going forward into generation three and onward when we have more normal catch rates to catch the Pokemon with. But uh, yeah, pretty difficult in generation two to catch Pokemon using Pokeballs only. After wanting to throw my DS at a wall for not catching Sunkern right away, we went back to Azalea town, talked to Kurt about the GS ball, and he realized something was going on in Ilex Forest, gave us back the GS ball, and we put it into the Mysterious Shrine, and we got ourselves an encounter with the mythical Pokemon Celebi. And a little thing to know about this event is that they're always coded onto the Crystal version on the Virtual Console, and you get one per save file. If you have a physical copy of Crystal version, you probably have to hack in order to get this event. But we put Celebi into a quarter HP and a sleep with our trusty Eradicate and Venusaur from the last episode and caught it after only a few Pokeballs. We then got word that there was an outbreak of Quillfish, so I simply fished for a Quillfish and caught it before the outbreak went away. And yeah, we just get that over with nice and easy. With the outbreak Pokemon on my mind, I wanted to go for the 1% Yanma, but doing so, I ended up finding two Snubbles, so I caught those to complete the line. And then we found ourselves a Yanma after quite a few encounters. I then made my way south of Blackthorn City in order to get a Skarmory. We also needed two Donphan as Donphan has a gender difference. We also needed two Gligar as Gligar has a gender difference as well. And then we went into Dark Cave right by the same route we were currently at to get ourselves two Ursaring and Ursaring also has a gender difference. We then made our way to Route 17 in Kanto in order to catch Slugma for some reason because I guess Johto Pokemon are just in Kanto and not Johto, so there's that. Then we went back to Ice Path to catch ourselves three Swinub. We needed one for Swinub and two for Piloswine as Piloswine has a gender difference. And Bill calls us again, telling us that box one is full. Before we send the Pokemon up though, I wanted to breed my Ursarings and my Don fans together in order to get a Fampy and a Teddy Ursa as Fampy and Teddy Ursa can be encountered in this game, but they're only 5% and morning only, so I would have had to change my clock and then deal with the 5% encounter when I could just breed for them and get them guaranteed. So we did that. Then I sent the parent Pokemon along with the rest of the wave into Pokemon Bank. We then surfed for a bit on the route south of Olivine City and found ourselves a Mantine. And after that, we hatched our Teddy Ursa and Fanpy eggs. And here's another big thing I need to explain. So in the last video, we actually ended up getting an Omni Ammonite, and Ammonite was one of those Pokemon that you only get one per save file, and I would have had to keep playing through save files. So I ultimately just took an Ammonite that I already had caught on one of my save files and used it for my living decks. We're gonna do the same thing with Suicune, as I already caught Suicune in the save file, and I didn't wanna have to restart a save file over again, play through most of it just to catch an additional Suicune, so we're just gonna count this one. Next, we found the Karate Man and received ourselves a Tyrogue. We need to evolve this into Hitmontop and then breed for it to get Tyrogue and Hitmontop. On our way to level up Tyrogue, we ended up finding a couple Magmar, which I should explain, we need a bunch of baby Pokemon in this generation, and I am I am using Ultra Balls to catch the parent Pokemon as these Generation 1 Pokemon we have already caught using Pokeballs in the last video, so it doesn't really matter what we catch these in. We're not counting these for our living decks anyway. We just want the babies. While we were leveling up our Tyrogue, we also found a Larvitar, so we needed to get three of those for the full line. And if you didn't know about Tyrogue, in order to evolve it into Hitmontop, you need to have its attack stat and defense stat be the same values. If you have the attack stat higher, it'll evolve into a Hitmonlee. If you have the defense stat higher, it'll evolve into a Hitmonchan. And if they're even, it'll evolve into a Hitmontop. We had to mess a bunch with vitamins and trying to sort of EV train. EV training is kind of bizarre in these past games. But eventually, after level 26, we got the correct stats and Tyrogue evolved into Hitmontop. Normally, Tyrogue evolves at level 20, but took us till level 26 to get it to be correct. 
Next, we had to get a bunch of nighttime exclusive Pokemon. As most of what we'd done before was during the day, we had to set our clock to nighttime and get a bunch of different Pokemon. In this case, for Ice Path, we need to get a Delibird and two Sneasels. The reason we need two Sneasels is because of the gender difference it has with the feather on its head. We needed to go to Mount Silver to get ourselves a Mischievous at night. And we needed to go to the right of Saladon in order to get two Murkrows for the gender difference and three Hounders for the gender difference. Now, Hounder does not have a gender difference but houndoom does so that's why we need three and then we went back to dark cave and got wabafet which we did need two wabafets for the gender difference we then made our way south of acrutique city to get a stantler at night and with that we needed to send another wave of pokemon into pokemon bank and this is also when I noticed when I sent Mr. Mime from my Johto game into Pokemon Bank instead of my Kanto. So we'll have to catch another one of those again. Then we did some breeding. I got myself a couple Togepi. I actually got three Togepi eggs because we need one for Togekiss later on. And I have the egg. I will hatch it in a later video. Then we hatched three Totodiles to get the full line for that. And going back to Kanto again, we got to get Mr. Mime for the third time. And this time I wasn't going to mess this up. We named it properly, traded it over to my Generation 1 game, and then sent it up into Pokemon Bank from there right away so we wouldn't forget. And we got our Mr. Mime caught from Kanto with our original trainer and with the proper capitalization and spacing of its name. Going back to hatching some eggs, we hatched our second Tyrogue for the full line. And we also hatched two Pseudowoodo. Pseudowoodo is another Pokemon that you can only get one per save file, but with breeding in this game, you can get more and we needed two for the gender difference. Luckily, I got both genders first try. Next egg we hatch is a Magby. Then after we get an Iggly buff, Right after that, we get a Pichu, then we get a Cleffa. And while I was hatching these eggs, I realized that there were a couple Pokemon from Crystal that I forgot to catch in the wild. This being Miltank and Dunsparce. Now Miltank, I just completely forgot about, so here's us catching Miltank. And Dunsparce is a 1% encounter, so it's pretty difficult. I didn't want to do it right away, but if you have Hiker Anthony in your contacts, he will periodically call you about a Dunsparce outbreak. But in order to not wait for this, and you can do the same with any other outbreak in these games, is all you have to do is talk to your mom in your house, and she will ask you if you want to set the clock for daylight savings time, and you just do that, and 50% of the time, you will get a call from whoever is in your contacts. If it's only Hiker Anthony, it will only be him, and eventually he'll call you about a Dunsparce outbreak. So we got our outbreak of Dunsparce and instead of a 1% it became a 40% which is going to be super useful when we go for the three segment to Dunsparce but we'll save that for later. Then we hatched the last few baby Pokemon being Smoochum and Elekid and from there there was only a few more Pokemon we had to breed for mainly the starters. So we started up a new save file on my silver copy and picked Chikorita. I picked Chikorita so I could save in front of it and simply reset for the gender as I didn't want to hatch eight plus eggs in order to get the female one as Meganium, much like Venusaur, has a gender difference, and it's a 1 in 8 gender ratio for all the starters. So after a few resets, we ended up getting a female Chikorita, which was great, and I proceeded to play through that game with it as my starter, and inevitably evolved it into a Bayleaf and Meganium. And from here, I needed to catch the rest of the wild Pokemon that are exclusive to Gold and Silver that you cannot catch in Crystal version. First being Remoraid, we needed to do the Daylight Saving Time glitch in order to get Fisherman Wilton to get us a Remoraid Outbreak. The reason why I wanted a Remoraid Outbreak is you can normally catch them anytime, only if you have the Super Rod. And you get the Super Rod in Kanto, and I didn't want to have to play through all the game. But if you get the Outbreak for Remoraid, you can catch it with both an old and a good rod, as well as a Super Rod. So we had the old and good rod. We decided to not play through the entirety of the game and get ourselves three Remoraids. We needed three because Remoraid doesn't have a gender difference, but Octil does. I then went north of Mahogany Town and got myself three Mareep for the full line along with two Girafferig as Girafferig has a gender difference. And those were all the wild Pokemon we needed to catch for gold and silver. So we sent them up into Pokemon Bank along with our baby Pokemon that we hatched. And then I decided to start up my gold copy just to get myself a Cyndaquil and obviously we just picked Cyndaquil from the start. This time instead of playing through the whole game we played up until we had access to trading and then just traded it off to my crystal version in order to breed for it to get four Cyndaquil. We need four Cyndaquil, three for the line, and one for the Hisuian Typhlosion. While doing that, we also bred for the last of the Chikorita line and sent these starters into Pokemon Bank. Now it's time for probably the hardest challenge of this entire video. 
catching the roaming Raikou and Entei. Now, as you saw before, we got Raikou down to quarter HP when we found it the first time. So all we needed to do is put it to sleep and chuck a few balls at it. But even at a quarter HP and asleep with a Pokeball, it's only about a 5% catch rate. So it takes you roughly 20 Pokeballs to catch. But uh, this happened. It's going to be fun. Uh, should be sometime in the middle of June. I'm still not sure what kind of setup I'll be rocking this year. I might break out the Great Marsh and the 20-foot HDMI cable again. Still not sure. I think Kanto Safari for sure is on the table for me, though. In, uh, Fire no shot, dude. I, I caught that in three balls when one of them it wasn't even asleep. It's a 5%. So Raikou was super easy to catch. I assumed Entei would be quite a bit harder as I got really lucky with Raikou and I figured my luck would run out with Entei. Sure enough, it did, but let me explain just how terrible it was to catch Entei. So in order to get Entei, you have to do the whole system with checking the Pokedex after you've seen it the first time. Luckily, the first time, if you haven't seen it, you can do a repel trick in order to repel all of the lower level Pokemon out. So if you are running through routes, you can end up just randomly encountering Entei if it ends up being on your route. After that, you can track it in your Pokedex, but there's a very bizarre system to this. After doing a bit of research, I found out that there's a system in these games that prevents you from essentially cheesing it and just going back and forth between the two routes until you get the roamer on the correct route you're on. And the reason why this is such a pain is because it makes for a lot of impossible scenarios. If Entei's in a specific spot, it can be pretty much impossible to get it on the spot you're trying to get it to with that system in play. So you have to just go for a very long time, changing routes, going different areas, and just hoping that Entei ends up being on the route that you are also currently on. And on top of that, even if you do everything correctly, Entei is still a one in 10 chance that you even encounter it on that route with a one in 16 chance that after you encounter a Pokemon, it'll change routes again. 1 in 16 doesn't seem too bad, but if you factor in the 1 in 10 chance that you even encounter Entei, you'll realize that it'll run away before you even encounter it many times, after it already took you a very long time to even get Entei on the same route as you. On top of that, you have to make sure you have a Pokemon that is faster than it, that can put it to sleep, or use Mean Look, or something like that, and it's very difficult to get something like that below level 40, so you usually have to use a really high level Pokemon and just not use a repel trick, which is very unfortunate. After a bunch of trial and error, my strategy that I used was to catch a Paris in generation one, give it 10 Carbos to make its speed stat significantly higher than normal, and then just spam feed it a bunch of rare candies from the missing no glitch in order to get it to level 100. This way it has access to Spore. This is a sleep move that has 100% accuracy, meaning it won't miss on Entei. And if you don't use the Carbos on Paris, then it won't be faster than Entei even at level 100 which isn't really unfortunate, but if you can get the Paris to Spore before the Entei, then all you have to do is chuck balls and hope after it wakes up, it doesn't go for Roar. And if it doesn't, then you're chilling. If it does, then you have to relocate it again. There's really nothing you can do about it, but that was my strategy. I just used the level 100 Paris, and after way too many hours, I finally caught it. <gasps> I caught it. <laughs> I had to EV train and set up this Parasect, and I got it on the first attempt using this Parasect. That took way too long to do. Oh my gosh. For the record, I caught this thing in a Master Ball just so I could check its speed stat so I could get a Parasect fast enough. And then I reset over it so I could catch in a Pokeball for this challenge. That was so terrible. And Raikou took us like two balls to catch.
After catching Entei, we decided to get the last couple legendary birds. Now, this time we went for Ho-Oh. While I'm trying to catch Ho-Oh, um, let me explain. It actually didn't take me too long to catch Ho-Oh. It has Recover, which is kind of annoying, but you'll find that Lugia is significantly more annoying to catch. One thing I need to stress about Ho-Oh in Pokemon Crystal, I actually tweeted about this, and a lot of people seem that they didn't know it. I didn't know about it either. But in order to actually get access to Ho-Oh in Pokemon Crystal, you have to have caught all three legendary beasts on your save file they have to be your original trainer your id they have to be caught on your save file you have to currently have all three of them and if you don't you don't get access to the rainbow wing and you'll never get ho -Oh. i had to learn that the hard way i had already sent my suicune up into pokemon bank so i then had to get ho -Oh in my silver version in silver version you just get to pewter city and you get the rainbow wing from an npc who's in pewter city it's, it's, it's a lot easier you don't have to catch the beast you don't even, i don't even think you have to set the beast free you just, just get it way easier. So after bringing ho to low HP and putting it to sleep, it honestly didn't take us too long to catch. It's also about a 5% catch like the beasts were, and it only took us like probably seven or eight balls to catch it. I also want to point out that I didn't want to take any chances with this one as ho has a hyphen in its name, and I didn't want it to mess up with the naming like Mr. Mime did, so before I sent it up, I named it ho with the proper capitals. There's no spaces in ho -Oh, so you don't have to worry about that, but I, I just didn't want to trust that hyphen in the name, so we just named it ho -Oh with the proper capitals. And then came Lugia. Now Lugia, like ho -Oh, also has Recover, but you'll find that Recover is the least of your issues while catching Lugia, as Lugia gets the move Safeguard. Now what Safeguard does is prevent the Pokemon from any status conditions, meaning that if it uses Safeguard, I cannot put it to sleep until the Safeguard wears off, and that was the biggest hindrance in this battle as having Lugia asleep quintupled the catch rate. It went from a 1% to a 5% catch rate, which is significantly better. But if it went for safeguard, I had to essentially just work with a 1% catch rate and that was just awful. So we had to keep either stalling turns out or waiting or just chucking Pokeballs with no hope of catching it until the safeguard wore off and then every so often it would go for recover and heal so we had to weaken it and then use spore and it was it was a huge ordeal but eventually something crazy happened and i just wanted to show my full unfiltered reaction to catching this lugia why was raikou and ho -Oh so easy to catch no <laughs> dude there's no way man Are you kidding me? That was a that was like a one percent chance. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, I not asleep. That was a one point one seven percent chance. I'll take it. Dude, safeguard was awful. After catching all the legendaries, these were the last Pokemon we needed from Generation 2, so we sent them into Pokemon Bank. And then we needed to catch the last two Unknown letters, so we do this in Fire Red and Leaf Green, as these were the games that Unknown, Exclamation Point, and Question Mark were introduced. We have to do this goofy little puzzle in the Tenobi Key. After that puzzle's been activated, you get access to Unknown letters in the Tenobi Ruins. If you go to the far left Tenobi Ruins, you get the Unknown, Exclamation Point, 1% of the time, so it can take a while to find it, but it didn't take us super long to find it. And on the far right ruins, you get the unknown question mark 1% of the time, which this one actually did take us a while to find. It took us like probably 50 minutes to find it, but they're really easy catches and we actually have normal catch rates in generation three. I could explain how to send Pokemon from generation three into Pokemon Bank and onward, but I figured we'll have to do that with pretty much every Pokemon in the next episode. So I will save the explanation for there, but we did send the exclamation point and question mark unknown along with a few of stragglers that we quickly released into Pokemon Bank. And now we gotta do a bunch of evolutions. To start, I wanted to do a bunch of trade evolutions and friendship evolutions in my Sun and Moon games, mainly because I can't trade in my Switch games, I only have one Switch. And it's very easy to get Eevee reducing berries in Sun and Moon via Pokepelago, which raise friendships, so you can just mass feed a bunch of them to your Pokemon to max out their friendship. So we evolved our Gen 1 Chansey into Blissey, and then our Gen 1 Zubat into Golbat and then Crobat. We got our Gen 1 Hottish into Gloom and then Blossom. 
We got our Gen 1 EV into Umbreon and then another Gen 1 EV into Espeon later. We then just decided to do a Sunstone evolution for Sunkern into Sunflora because I had some extra Sunstones. And we got our Togepi into Togetic. And then we had to do some trade evolutions. So I evolved my Gen 1 Poliwags into Poliwhirls and we started to do our trade evolutions. This one we did Onyx into Steelix. We have our two Gen 1 Onyxes that we got for the gender differences for Steelix. We then evolved our two Gen 1 Poliwhirls into Politoed with the gender difference. We then got our Slowpoke into Slowking our Seedra into Kingdra, our Porygon into Porygon 2, and our two Scythers into Scizor with the gender difference. I then sent all of my bank Pokemon into Pokemon Home and organized my boxes accordingly. We already pre-ordered everything in Pokemon Bank, including all of the later gen forms we needed just so we could easily move them from box to box, and it actually worked out really well. Then we sent everything we could into Sword and Shield to evolve it using our mass supply of rare candies. So we got our Noctowl, our Lantern, our two Zatus with the gender difference, our Azumarill, our two Piloswines with the gender difference, our two Octillaries with the gender difference, and our Larvitar into Pupitar and Tyranitar. We then had to send the rest of the Pokemon into Pokemon Shining Pearl because they were not available in Sword and Shield. So we evolved our Chikorita into Bayleaf, our Cyndaquil into Quilava, our Totodile into Croconaw. We evolved Lediba into the two Ledian with the gender difference. We ended up getting our Male Meganium and our Feraligator. We then evolved our Mareep into Flaffy, our Spinarak into Ariados, our Hoppip into Skiploom, and one of our Quilavas into Typhlosion. We evolved one of the Skiplooms into Jumpluff, our Flaffy into Ampharos, our Snubble into Granbull, our Hounder into Hound Dooms with the gender difference and our Slugma into Magcargo and our Pineco into Foratris. We then went to Legends Arceus and evolved our second Quilava into the Hisuian Typhlosion. And after that, we sent all these new evolutions back into Pokemon Home. And at this point, we just needed to catch new regional variants. So we made our way into the Isle of Armor in Sword and Shield and got ourselves another Galarian Slowpoke, which we then located this lady off in the backside of this cave in order to get a Galarica Reef in order to evolve our Galarian Slowpoke into Galarian Slow King. We then went to our Shield version and located a Galarian Corsola in the wild area and then we went back into Legends Arceus found ourselves a Hisuian Quillfish and our two Hisuian Sneasels for the gender difference. Fun fact about Hisuian Sneasel is that it's the only regional variant Pokemon with a gender difference. No other regional variant Pokemon have gender differences. We then sent these new Pokemon into Pokemon Home and much like the ending of last episode we are ending this episode off catching one of the most mythical Pokemon one of the craziest rarest Pokemon of all time one worthy of the title, Paldean Wooper. So we easily caught this Paldean Wooper, and unfortunately, because Home is still not compatible with Scarlet and Violet just yet, we have to hold off before putting these ones into Pokemon Home. So there is my completed Gen 2 living decks in Pokemon Home. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope it helped you out in any way trying to find these Pokemon, inspired you to do this on your own. Let me know in the comments what you think of this series and if you're doing something like this yourself. So uh, yeah, that's gonna be it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, ring those notification bells, all that good stuff. Be sure to join the domination and I will see you in the next video.